Omar. He was such a natural, good person, a timid, caring, warm guy. Whoever has not seen Elvis live has missed the greatest entertainer of the 20th century. Elvis would have, in any role, would have adapted to it and been able to perform fantastic. He was lovable, he was dangerous. I think he had more girlfriends than he had guy friends. Yeah, I don't know, there was something about him that just drew you in. When Elvis got into a bad mood, it was like a huge black cloud that came over and he had a very quick temper. All the business uh, uh, guarantees that were given Elvis were all broken. Okay, it eventually broke Elvis. In the movie years, the drugs were in control. We were going so hard that Elvis started getting a bloody nose. He told me, yeah, I don't want to get married, but I'm being forced to. Colonel Parker was one of the most degenerate gamblers I've ever known in my life. I never thought it was a permanent thing. We really sort of majored everything we had and knew at the time to prevent it. He'd just look at me and say, I can't. I owe too much to too many people. The only thing that's important is that that man is on stage tonight. I never knew he was dying until he died. My name is Jerry Schilling. Uh, I met Elvis in 1954 at the age of 12 years old. Growing up in North Memphis, uh, I went to the local park one day. It's called Dave Wells Community Center, Guthrie Park. It was a little school called Guthrie. And uh, sometimes people would play basketball, football, or whatever. It was the only kind of park to go to. I went there this Sunday, and there were five older boys. Uh, like high school, I was in grade school, trying to get up a sixth player to play football. And one of the older guys was um, a friend of my older brother's, Red West. And, and he said, Jerry, do you want to play with us? We went in the hole, and I saw this guy. It was Elvis Presley. That was it for me. Changed my whole life. I wanted to be like him. He was lovable, he was dangerous, everything a young kid would admire. I remember going home, saying a little prayer that night, saying, gosh, I really, I mean, a real prayer, saying, I really, I really wish he would be my friend. Elvis was a bit of a loner back then. He had maybe three or four friends that lived in the same housing project he did, and primarily was shy, did not really come out of his shell until a couple of talent shows and the girls started screaming. I mean, he, he always liked girls. I mean, uh, I think he had more girlfriends than he had guy friends. It was at Sun Studios. Sam Phillips had started the label. When I was over there that night, uh, I think Scotty and Bill had just left. And Elvis was getting ready to leave, and I walked in, and Sam introduced me to him. And we sat and talked a few minutes, and uh, he and Elvis said to me, he said, uh, are you coming back? I said, yeah, I guess so, why? He said, come on back over. He said, I'll be over here again tomorrow night. And so I went over again the next night, and uh, uh, one thing led to the other. It was just a case where he, I liked him, he liked me. We would touch base in 55 and 56, and we'd get together, and. When he moved over to Alderman Drive, I went over there. I was over there a lot. And so, I mean, we were in and out of each other's lives for about two years before I went with him. So you know, that's how that really came about. A lot of song, the day would never end. A lot of song, the man he got a friend. But without a song, the road would never be A lot of song. So I keep singing a song. When I was a child, ladies and gentlemen, I was a dreamer. I read comic books, and I was the hero of the comic books. I saw movies, and I was the hero of the movies. Whatever dream that I ever dreamed has come true a hundred times. Move on over here. These type of people who care and are dedicated 
You realize that it's not possible that they might be building the kingdom. It's not too far fetched from reality. My name is Sonny West. I was 20 years old when I met Elvis in 1958. Elvis, Red, and myself grew up in housing projects, government housing projects, where you could only make so much amount of money and you lived there. And there was three of them in, in Memphis. There was Lamar Terrace, where I was raised up, Lauderdale Courts, where Elvis was, was there, and then a place called Hurt Village, which Red and us always joked about that name because you were hurting. The Lamar Terrace gang was known as being the toughest gang around. We had some really bad dudes, and they started us out young. So this is Manassas Avenue, where Humes High School used to be. It is now a middle school camp called Humes. And this is where Elvis went to school the whole time he was in Memphis. When he moved up, he was going into the seventh grade, so he started here. This is the only school he went to in Memphis, seventh through the twelfth. Elvis knew about Red, his reptile, because he went to Humes. And Red had uh, told Elvis, you know, about his cousin. I got a cousin uh, that can go pretty well for the Lamar Terrace and uh, in that gang over there. My first impression when I met Elvis in 1958 was it was hard to believe that this was such a superstar. He was such a natural, good person, attentive, caring, a warm guy. Just when you talk to him, he just talked to you like my cousin Red talked to me or some of the other guys, and he just was, he, he, I don't know, there was something about him that just drew you in. You know, here you are in this pretty rigid Southern society. Everybody had come out of a depression from the war and everything, and this was the 50s. It was the first, I think, society of young people looking for its own identity. He's the only star I have ever met that looked like, acted like, a special person, a star, before he had a hit record, before he did a mo movie. I've met a lot of those stars that movies and records and adulation and all those things kind of make you into a star. Elvis was born a star. But I'll never... The first time that I appeared on stage, it was a, a, it was a charity in Memphis in a place called The Shell. When I left the stage, they were yelling and screaming and so forth. I did two songs, and it scared me to death, man. I don't know what I'd done. So the, the, the manager backstage, I said, what I do, what I do? He said, well, whatever it is, go back and do it again. <laughs> so I went back out, did the same thing again. I really didn't know what I was, what the yelling was about. I didn't realize that my, the, I was moving, my body was moving. During his speedy ascent to fame, beginning in 1956 and continuing for an entire 13 years, Elvis began starring in movies. Oh man, they were wonderful years. They, they were the best. The movie years were the best years that I spent with him. They were not only the first years I spent with him, but they just far outweigh the, the touring. You know, it wouldn't have bothered me if he'd never toured again. I mean, if he'd just kept, but he wanted to make other movies and he should have. He should have had more drama because you see King Creole and Jailhouse Rock, you know he can carry a drama. He can carry a role. <laughs> Get up. Get, get up, up baby. Please, uh, leave her alone. Get up. Leave her alone. Come on. Get up. Oh, boy. You're a pretty fancy performer, ain't you, kid? Now you know what I do for an encore. Come on, get out of here. He, I learned from the very start. I sleep when he sleeps. We used to have a thing, in fact, on Paramount, on GI Blues, they had a, a club scene in there, and he had kept us up late, and I just couldn't stay awake, and I hadn't taken anything, so I went over to a dead set and got into a booth there in the nightclub set, and they were shooting on another one, and laid down on the booth to get some sleep, and one of the crew guys up on the catwalk just pointed me out to Elvis. I found out later, he pointed me out. And Elvis came around when he got through with his business owners. He came around and he looked for me. And he saw me through there because I had there a couple of tables stacked up and I kind of put a little camouflage so I couldn't be seen easy. 
Oh, man. Boom, he threw that table and chair, and I woke up straight up. He said, damn you, Sonny, I told you you sleep when I sleep. I said, I'm, I'm up, boss. I just took a break. Just took a break. And the contracts were signed like four years in advance. So I had thought that uh, they would try to get a new property for me or give me a chance to show some kind of acting ability or do a very interesting story. But it did not change. It did not change. And so I, I became very discouraged. They couldn't have paid me no amount of money in the world to make me feel any uh, self-satisfaction inside. He talked about him as being travel logs starring Elvis Presley. He said, I go somewhere and I get in a fight and I sing to women and I sing to the guy after I hit him. And he would make little jokes about it. He says, travel log, Hawaii, Mexico, you know, everywhere he went. But you still did it. You must have I, I had to. I had to. What kind of film would you have lied to if you would have had your choice? That's hard to say. I, uh... I'd like to have something that was more challenging instead of Hollywood's image of what they thought I was. Elvis would have, in any role, would have adapted to it and been able to perform fantastic. But for two years, something brought Elvis's acting career to a pause. Elvis Presley no longer has that rock and roll beat. The tempo is hut, two, three, four for Private Presley. He's at Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, beginning his two-year army hitch courtesy of the Memphis Draft Board. Like any ex-civilian raw recruit, the king of rock and roll will be keeping time to non-hip bugle calls. Involuntarily retired, a gyrating guitarist departure from the public eye left his blue jean fans all shook up, so we hear. But Elvis doesn't seem to mind at all. My name is Joe Esposito. Uh, I met Elvis in uh, 1959, and I was 21 years old at the time. Uh, yeah, I got drafted in the Army the same time Elvis did. Combat Command C was named the base. And uh, I was there for about 30 days, and then uh, we heard the rumor that Elvis was coming to our base. So uh, one night I was working late in the office uh, with my friend George DiDemigio and my partner. We were, I was a finance clerk for the Army. I lucked out. And, uh, and we see all these people starting to gather up around outside the, the gates of the camp. And uh, I asked George, what's going on? He says, well, you heard Elvis is coming to our base tonight. And all of a sudden, about 8 o'clock at night, buses come in with all these troops, and kids were screaming, yelling. Elvis was on the bus somewhere. You couldn't see him because everybody's dressed in GIs, and it was dark at night. But they all stood out there for hours and hours and screamed and yelled. And I saw him around the base at different times. I never got to know him because he was in tanks and I was in artillery. And um, he'd come in off base because he was living off base. He had a house uh, for his uh, dad and for his grandmother. And uh, he would come speeding in real quick, running late, and you'd see him drive by the barracks. And and uh, that's the only way only I used to see him once in a while. While I was there, uh, I met this gentleman uh, while I was in Germany. His name is Wes Daniels. He was a photographer for the Army. Uh, he was in the Army, too, and he was assigned to take pictures of Elvis for promotional, for PR, for the Army. Elvis and a bunch of his Army buddies played football on the weekends near his house. And Wes Daniels asked me one day, so we need some more players. Would you like to go play football and meet Elvis? I said, be, I would love to. And that's how it all started. I went to, to his house in Bad Neuheim, and I was introduced to him at that time. Yes, after that day, after we played a little football and went over his house and visited a little bit, uh, he invited me to come over anytime on the weekends, uh, uh, just to... Uh, hung out with him a lot of times. However, after just a few months in the Army, something terrible happened. Elvis's mother, Gladys, was diagnosed with hepatitis. Elvis was granted emergency leave to visit her, arriving in Memphis on August 12th. Two days later, on August 14th, Gladys Presley died. Elvis's friend, Judy Spreckles, spoke on her experience of seeing Elvis shortly after it happened, saying, I have never seen anyone as sad as Elvis was. He cried continuously. We were in the front hall at Graceland, and he stood there hugging me for a half hour. For Elvis, it was traumatic, and it took a long time for him to get over it. Many consider it to be an underlying cause for Elvis's slow but eventual downfall. While still on military service, Elvis met the girl who changed everything, Priscilla Bewley, at a party in his rented home in Germany. 
First time he met Priscilla, I happened to be at the house that evening uh, when uh, she was introduced to him. And uh, uh, when she walked in the door, I mean, a very pretty young lady, but I didn't know how old she was at the time. And uh, I figured she was about 16, but at the time she was 14, I find out later. Uh, but she was very mature, uh, very very quiet at first, because naturally walked in the room with all these guys in there. And, uh, and then Elvis, you know, I mean, uh, that's a pretty tough uh, situation to be in. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'll never forget that day. It's called lust. <laughs> a young girl, she liked young girls. She thought if they got 18, they were ready for Social Security. It, uh, you know, it was one of those things. He didn't, uh, he didn't, uh, well, he just liked young girl because you can manipulate a young girl right. better than you can that an older one. I, 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 I think it's too, it fed his ego. I mean, that's all face it. It had it's to. called manipulation. <laughs> it is, really. It did. I tell you what, well, that, pure I tell you what part of that came from. Listen, but when she started dating her, I said, listen, you know, you better get some keys. And he said, what are you talking about? This is June 14, I'd carry back home. Back to June, we back to June. And I said, you need to get some keys. And he said, what do we need keys for? I said, the fucking jail cell that I'll put our ass in for you dating a 14 year old girl. We ain't gonna be able to I'll tell out. you where part of that came from. What? Why Frank Freeman, who used to be the head of- Oh, the somewhere out there, yeah. He was 70, 80 years old. Yeah. And, and we, used to, we used to notice that he would walk the studio with this beautiful, beautiful young girl. They were probably starlets, you know. Oh, they were wannabe. Yeah. So Dr. Blank at MGM Studios, who was the studio doctor, Elvis went there for, for a shot. And he was talking to Dr. Blank. And he asked him, he says, Dr. Blank, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, I see Mr. Freeman, you know, with all these young girls. He said, he's 70, 80 years old. He said, what can you do with these girls? And Dr. Black looked at him and he said, Elvis, when you get Mr. Frank's, Mr. Freeman's age, he said, come see me. He said, I'll give you something that'll allow you to do that. He said, always remember one thing. He said, what's that? He said, when times get down, there's always a 15-year-old girl around the corner. Well, he never bit, forgot that. I've never had anything, I think, in Did my life. that have a bearing on it, you think? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I never had anything in my life scare me any worse. Than but that. I, I think mean, it's back to what... I think about the Jerry Lee Lewis thing in my mind. What you said, Lamar, yeah. about the yeah. control. Uh, he can a 14 control. or 15-year-old yeah. girl is not worldly yet. She's she's very uh, so nice she immature. <laughs> she's very... And he he would take uh, yeah. he would take these girls and mold them. And he Priscilla, did. he molded. Yes, he did. And the, I mean, Priscilla saw the day, black hair do. She yeah, had Priscilla her hair. to this day is what Elvis made her. Yeah, well, that's, that's why he always used but, that. You know, I don't know what she's like today, so I wouldn't know. That's why I, he always used that expression. I don't want to have to. I think she still goes to a Corvette dealership if it could work though. No, I think uh, you're looking at whole. It's like with us. I mean, yeah, our lifestyle it, it changed. You know, it had to, and hers did too. After you know, Elvis. That, I think that the, I but, think that uh, she, under the circumstances, at the, she did at a very the time, good time. You know, he could raise her. He. He didn't want an actress she could write for a wife. Mm -hmm. You know somebody. You know, you know somebody else. He didn't. He didn't. You know like somebody else. The kid call you. Huh? You are. You're. We're speaking from the voice of experience. You married a young lady too. Yeah. And I hated your guts for it ever since you did it. <laughs> it's been wonderful, over <laughs> here. I think Priscilla and I, and we were the youngest in the group felt the shyest at the time. And it's never anything that we sit down and, you know, talked about or anything, but I, I, I definitely felt it. Years later, we, we've kind of talked about it, you know? And it, and it was hard to do. Elvis was a very jealous person, okay, with anybody. And there's a line that you had to be very careful of, of even if, 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 if my affection for Priscilla was just on a human level, you had to be careful how you expressed that, where it didn't cause jealousy. Elvis's jealousy, along with his short fuse, led to lots of issues and arguments with the people around him. Elvis had a temper. He had a bad temper. His mother had one. 
Uh, and I think he got that from her. But that's about the only quality that he got from her that wasn't good, because everything else about her was giving and warm and sharing and everything. But his temper was like a black cloud when it came in full blown, buddy. It was a category five tornado, okay? It just covered all the area around, the whole room, the whole atmosphere. And you didn't know until you knew who it was about that had got him that way, what thoughts, who he was thinking about that got him this or who had done something. You may have done something the night before or earlier that day that might have got him mad like this. So you didn't know and you really didn't feel a whole lot of relief when it wasn't even you that he was upset you st because it was still there. It was still there weighing down on you. You know, Elvis uh, was a pretty even-tempered guy, but when he did something flared up and got mad, he had a bad temper. There was no in-betweens. He was really the nicest guy in the world, and sometimes he would snap and just have a real bad temper, and, and he'd scare the hell out of you sometimes. There was one instance I remember uh, during the movie Wild in the Country, uh, Christina Crawford, uh, Joan Crawford's daughter, was one of the co-stars in the movie. Well, we became friends. I invited her up to the house one evening uh, to uh, hang out, you know, Elvis knew who she was. So we're sitting there watching a little TV and sitting on the couch, and Elvis would smoke a cigar once in a while, so he picked up a cigar to smoke, take a cigar, and I reached over and lit a cigar for him. And she pulled my hand away from him. I went to do it again, and she pulled the cigar out of Elvis's mouth. She says, now oh, you shouldn't have to light a cigar. And I say, hey, don't do that. So Elvis really got mad. He got up, and he grabbed her by the hair and pulled her across the coffee table, which scared the hell out of me and everybody else, and they were really in shock. And he said, get her out of here. Take her home. Well, I didn't know what to do. I mean, this is the first time this ever happened to, to me uh, around Elvis, the first time I saw his temper like that. So I took her home and uh, took her in the car, and we were driving back. I says, what was all that about? She says, you have no idea. I don't believe that we should be waiting hand on foot on big stars just because they're a big star. She says, my mom, Joan Crawford, uh, was like that. Everybody had, had a weight on her hand and foot. And so she, she really didn't care for that too much. And uh, so she was all upset about it. And she was upset because Elvis, how Elvis talked her and told her to leave. Plus, she was on the movie. So we took her back. And the next day or two it was, I think, uh, she sent a nice little letter to, over to Elvis. and. Uh, you know, apologized and uh, sent him a case of Pepsis because at that time, Joan Crawford owned a Pepsi Cola company. And uh, she apologized and said she was sorry and just something hit her wrong at the time. And that was uh, quite a wild experience for me. When Elvis got into a bad mood, it was like a huge black cloud that came over and he had a very quick temper. And he'd say things that you've never heard before in your life. He would string expletives together and make words that you've never, <laughs> never heard of. And he'd be mad. And, and, but he'd stay mad for maybe 30 minutes, and then it'd be over. If, if it was directed towards somebody, one of the guys or what have you, at the end of 30 minutes, he'd uh, be overly joyful with the guy. He fired us en masse 10 times. Every one of you guys, get the fuck out of here. Go on home. And this wouldn't we'd be in LA. One time, Billy got mad after Elvis said that. And he looked at me and he said, take me to the damn airport. I said, you sure? I said, you know he's going to blow over. Take me to the airport. So Richard Davis and I took Billy to the airport, LA airport. And uh, his bag was put on the plane. And I get a page in the airport. So I go get to Paige, and it was Alan Fortas. He said, Elvis wants you to bring Billy back. So I went and told Billy. I said, hold on, Alan. I kept Alan on the phone. And Billy said, I'm not coming back unless he apologizes, which Elvis didn't like to do. And so I got back on the phone. I said, Alan, Billy, he said, let me, let me speak to Billy. I said, sure. So Billy gets on the phone, and he said, I want to talk to you, Alan. Because Alan was sitting right next to Elvis, he said, tell him if he wants me to come back, he needs to get on the phone and ask me to come back. Because Billy, especially when he was younger, he was stubborn as a mule. And so Elvis got on the phone, and Billy said, look, am I hired or fired? Are you hired? Come on back. He said, well, if you're waiting for me to say I'm sorry, this is Billy, 
I'm not saying I'm sorry. You're going to have to say you're sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. And he gave the phone back. He said, Elvis said it so quick. When he said, if I can't get my bag off the plane, I'm going to Memphis. They went and got the bag. We came back. Elvis had gone to bed. He didn't want to face us. So the next morning, Billy and I were sitting in the den with Elvis while he was having his breakfast. And he said to Billy, uh, you thought you were a smart out, didn't you? And Billy says, no, no, you know, you fired us. And Elvis looked at me and he said, where the hell did you think you were going? I said, I'm not staying around anywhere I'm not wanted. I'm not staying around anywhere I'm not wanted. So he mimicked me because it was all a joke to him then. As Elvis's movie years were coming to a close, the people around him began to see the first signs of his lack of business knowledge and how it was consistently used against him for the rest of his career. My name is Larry Geller. I met Elvis April the 30th, 1964. I was 24 years old. When I went to work for him in 64, he had been back from the Army four years. He did a two or three, you know, good movies when he came back. But the movies were getting weaker and weaker, and the soundtracks were getting, in some cases, more ridiculous and more ridiculous. And he didn't want to record too many movie songs. And he was promised when he did a movie song especially a situation scene, that they would never be released on records. It was another uh, lie to Elvis. You know, when he did uh, Old MacDonald Had a Form, that was never to come out. All the business um, uh, guarantees that were given Elvis were all broken, okay, which uh, eventually broke Elvis. While all of this was going on, Elvis had started experimenting with prescribed substances. Beginning in the mid-50s and continuing through his entire career, the king of rock and roll partied hard. Elvis, one, one weekend, he kept saying, we got to go do something this week. He said, let's go to Vegas. Well, I've never been to Vegas, and a lot of the other guys have never been to Vegas. So he said, OK, let's go. So we all jumped in the car. We didn't fly. We all jumped in the car, and we took off. We got there like about you know, 4, four or 5 o'clock in the evening. And at that time, the road we were coming down, you drive in, and you could see the lights of all Las Vegas. Now, it's not as big as it is today, but at that time, you could see the Strip. It was very prominent. It was very exciting. We drove down. He, he showed us, you know, the Sands Hotel, the Sahara, all the big hotels. And we went to the Sahara, Sahara Hotel. We went there for a week, and we just partied. I mean, all night, up all night. And some of the guys were drinkers. Elvis wasn't a drinker, neither was I. And all the hotels at that time, they all had big stars. All the big stars were in all the showrooms, and every hotel had a chorus line of ladies. So naturally, we went to see all these shows, and then we wanted to meet the girls. So we'd stay around the hotel and invite them all out to have a drink in the lounge, and we'd meet them. We'd go see different acts. Jackie Wilson, uh, Fats Domino was playing there, uh, famous uh, acts that Elvis loved. And we'd go sit and watch their shows in the evening. And we'd be up till 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. The sun would rise, and we'd go right to sleep. <laughs> Get away from the sun. We didn't want to see the sun. And we just did this for a week, 10 days. Elvis said, OK, we got to get out of here. We got to go back to LA. And we get in the car, start driving. I said, Elvis, what? why do we have to go back now? He said, well, I don't know. I just thought we'd been here too long. Ah, oh, let's go back. We turn around and go right back. We stayed two, three weeks at a time and just party. And one time, I forget, we were going so hard that Elvis started getting a bloody nose. And uh, we went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you guys need to get some rest. His resistance was getting down, and he kept getting a bloody nose, so we had to rest for a couple of days. Everyone in the public now knew of Elvis's use of prescription drugs, and that it was becoming a very real problem. 
It is said that the king of rock and roll had taken a wide range of different medications over the years, including morphine, Demerol, Placidil, Valium, codeine, ethinamates, quaaludes, and antidepressants. During all the fun and games, there were already warnings of what drug use would bring. In the movie years, the drugs were in control. The sleeping pills and the, the uppers for the energy level, I couldn't take them every day. Not to be the goody-goody, but I just, couldn't, I just couldn't take that pill because I knew what it was going to do to me. Make my mouth dry, it was just going to make me wired all day, and I just didn't want to do it. But I had to take them sometimes because he would stay up to 3 o'clock morning, 2.30, 3 o'clock, and we'd get up at 5 to go on location. Because we stay up all night, we, we drive all night, and uh, I want, want you to, I know you're not used to it, and I want you to, you know, keep up as far as uh, your attitude is concerned, you know. So he said, uh, I want to show you something. I said, okay. So out of his pocket came a little blue velvet case, a jewelry box, as a, a watch would come in or something like that. He said, open it up. <laughs> well, I opened it up and it was just chock full of pills of every color you can think of. And I said, good God, what is this? And he said, here, let me give you a few, and this will help you stay awake and, and be in a good mood. I said, okay. So he picked out about four of them, and he said, here, don't take them all at once, just take them every couple of hours. I stayed up for three days because I, I ne had never taken this stuff before. And to be quite honest with you, you know, it gives you one hell of a good feeling. And I wanted to keep feeling that way. So I kept taking them. I took them for 15 years. Uh, you know, I was had an addictive personality, so I think that it probably, but I mean, he would walk away from it. And I, and, but uh, then he'd go back to it. So it, you know, it was a magic potion, so to speak. It really was, it kept us going. When you took them, you uh, everything got real bright. And the uh, fact of the matter is, the doctors call them mood elevators. And it strictly, strictly take it to the top. It really would. It was, they were they were good. I think that's the only thing I can think that's akin to it would be when cocaine first came about in, in our time. Uh, you know, it was great. Everybody could use it. It wasn't addictive. Well, it turned out it was. Nobody knew. I mean, who knew? It's a recreation drug. You ever heard anything in the world called a recreation like a drug? My God, you know, there's no such thing. But back then it was called a recreation drug. Well, I mean, how much recreation can you do? So it really became uh, pervasive. I don't think there's any other term. When you start taking the uppers, which is what they were, in order to go to sleep, you need to start taking sleeping pills. So it gets to be a vicious circle. And where today one will work, Tomorrow you need two, and the next day you need three, and then the next day you need four. And after 15 years, it gets it gets pretty vicious. And at the end, the last few years, I was pretty strong into it. Although I was able to function as far as my business was concerned, still it puts you in a very in a, in a depressing mood. The worst thing that Elvis did, and he got me upset, got Sonny upset, is that he would use our names on prescriptions. He'd have a description My from Sunny West. I'd use Brian's, he'd use mine, he'd use Jamie's name. And I I went in one afternoon, I said, listen, this, this has got to stop. I said, they've got me down there for taking every damn thing there is. And he said, well, I don't want to think that I'm taking it. I said, well, listen, I don't want to think I'm taking it. And I said, you just need to back it up here. I said, you know. And he said, well, how about it? I just fire you and you won't have to worry about that anymore. I said, hey, fine, you know. And then you, you had come out, came out the door, and you came, you, you were bitching about it. And you went in and jumped on him about yeah, it. About and, then, and then he came back out and he said, well, you're hired. And I said, hell, I thought I was fired. I had a situation, I must tell you, that one time a Demerol, a liquid Demerol, came to the house in, on Montevel Drive in my son's name. And my son was like four or five months old by a doctor, a dentist in California that had written for Elvis. I intercepted it to see what it was, and I had no idea that my son's name was on there. I wanted to see what it was and see if there's something I could do to change some of the strength of it or whatever. And there was on this liquid Demerol bottle, Brian West. I went to Schwab's, took the bottle. I said, I want this taken off right now. I want it removed from your records. 
And so help me, I don't care who calls it in. If you ever send another drug up to that house in my, my wife, or my son's name, you're gonna be in trouble. You're gonna be in serious trouble. Dr. Nick had written in a year's time there are 10,000 tablets, either a year or two, I think it was one year time, that uh, an investigative reporter for 2020 found that he had written 10,000 tablets or medication, not individual, I'm talking about the total amount of pills and everything, 10,000, in one year's time. And of course, he said, well, some of the guys shared in those. <laughs> Elvis didn't share his drugs with you, man. I mean, he might give you a Percodan if you hurt yourself or something like that, but he's not giving it to you on a basis where you can just go ahead and get high from it every day. I think the main thing about the, the situation with all the drug stuff that he was taking is the way it affected us. We, everybody knows how it affected him, but it just totally terrorized us. Every day, the conversations would start with this and end with this, and it became an endless battle within the group to somehow outwit him. Remember that? Yes. We'd go to Aspen, we'd go to Snowmass, we would go to Hawaii, anywhere just to sort of get him out of rhythm. Remember that? Yeah. And if we got him out of rhythm, he would be straight and he would be fun. But then, like anybody, he would slip into it. And once again, it would just, it cast an almost perceivable Paul of the group. It was just, you could, you could touch it. It was so, it was so bad. Amidst all the partying and drug taking, Elvis decided it was time to settle down. Although many claim he may have been pushed. And she was gonna get rid of most of us. Very few succeed. She didn't succeed and didn't really try real hard until they got married. Once she had a ring on her finger is when she tried to separate Elvis from us, uh, with the exception of- But that's a hard thing to come into because you got so many around. <laughs> I mean, that's not easy. Oh, I know, I understand that. And I, and I said, yeah. you know, but that was between her and Elvis, not us. Uh, that's a good point. Because the fact of the matter is, we would have loved to spend more time with our families. Yeah. But, well, he, in, but he insisted, as you all know, he insisted that we be there. That's right. Well, you so know. that she would start planning things with like her and Elvis and Joe and Joni. And the other person who played a role in that was Colonel Parker. Yeah. That's why all those weekend trips to Palm Springs were just the four of them. Of course, Billy, myself, Billy's wife, Joe, Patsy, and a couple of other uh, people didn't want to go to Palm Springs anymore because of all that, because the atmosphere, the atmosphere was so totally changed. Lines between some of the guys on tour. Yeah, and, 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 and the atmosphere Joe. was changed. So she knew what she was getting into after she was here for maybe six months. Well, she was in the whirlwind. There was no doubt uh, about that. And See, he, he, he pushed her in a certain position. We, we've all agreed with this. Oh, he had every position you could think of. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> no, but I mean, she <laughs> was only around when pick he wanted position, her Pick a position, Billy. <laughs> Billy did. Wait. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, pick a position. But he yeah. really gave her no choice because he didn't want to go I think he tried it. <laughs> I, I, I think he tried it. And, I, I, and, and right after they got married, remember that, you know, he cut back on the group. You know, so I think he was trying to make that change. There was like, he didn't like the change. He, he didn't like it. Oh, no, he didn't like no. the change. No. Carl liked the change. Priscilla liked the change to some degree. Well, Carl liked to keep cut it down, you know. Factor, you know. But uh, he didn't like it. I mean, he... He didn't like being married. Right. She he didn't want to be married. He didn't want to be married. In the first place. He didn't want to get married to her. No. In the first place. It was not... It He'd was already not been married to her five years almost. You know, I mean, oh, you live in what they're he's raised yeah. since he was 14. I mean, every man's fantasy in his life. And you know, any normal man, a 14 year old girl, yeah, you're raised. Come on. The day he asked me to be the best man, he told me. Yeah. I don't want to get married, but I'm he being didn't. forced to. Yeah. Because but, Elvis's lifespan with a woman was anywhere from two to four years. I need to interject. It wasn't because he didn't love her. No, he did love. No, he, no. Cared he didn't want to get sure married he because he shouldn't have been married. He no. didn't want to. Marry no, I know. Yeah, yeah, that's the key. 
You know, he did well, run. He was more or less involved than was anything else right. at the time. Yeah. And that's all right. I was at Graceland. I was living there right in the, within the first year, and kind of this sensitive young guy. I didn't have a lot of hang-ups, actually, and hadn't seen Priscilla in a day or so, or Elvis. And uh, Priscilla came down the steps, and she didn't look good, you know? I just assumed she was sick, you know? And uh, I said, well, you know, where have you been? And, and she, she said, oh, I've just been, you know, upstairs. And I said, are you feeling okay, you know? I don't know what the response was. It was, you know, just, yeah, I'm fine. Thanks for asking or something, you know? And I didn't know what was wrong. It was her and Elvis had been in a two-day flight. And when she went back upstairs, I could hear the lamps flying. Evidently, what happened upstairs is they continued the argument, and Priscilla said something to the effect, well, at least Jerry cares how I'm feeling. And that didn't go over very, very well. So the next day, we're watching a football game downstairs. And um, Elvis had never said a cross word to me in all the years that I had known him. And he really wanted to, and, but he, he, was, he didn't direct it at me, but as soon as it started, and it was like, I don't need anybody looking out for, if I need, if somebody's gonna take care of Priscilla, it's me, I don't need you guys asking her how she feels. And man, I was crushed. I was crushed. And um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to pat my bags. You know, this was the fear of like being misinterpreted as somebody that would hit on somebody's girlfriend or something like that. And how do you explain it? And he hadn't even directed it to me. I was crushed and I think he knew that. But you know, Elvis was so sensitive. I can't remember what he did, but it was very shortly where he kind of gave me a wink. And then he said, Jerry, let's go for a ride. He never mentioned it again. And I felt like a million dollars again, you know? On July 31st, 1969, two years into his marriage with Priscilla and a year after their daughter Lisa Marie was born, Elvis did his very first show at the International Hotel in Las Vegas, beginning his long run that continued for the rest of his life. His manager, Colonel Tom Parker, was the sole maker of this crazy business decision that was a huge contributor to the downfall of Elvis. This was also the first time some members of the Memphis Mafia had met the Colonel and began to see the man he truly was. You know, when I first met Colonel Parker in Nashville at the recording session before we went to the Sinatra show, uh, he didn't know me. He had no idea who I was. All you know was this kid from Chicago. I mean, he was a little leery of me, uh, but why is he here, you know? And Elvis introduced me to him. He was, he was very nice to him, but I know that he was a little standoffish. So I really don't think he knew what I was gonna do around there. But then I guess after a while, you know, I was sort of the people that he would contact to tell Elvis things. And we got to sort of become friends. He realized I was doing a job that had to be done and I wasn't goofing off. And uh, he had a good relationship with a lot of the other guys because he knew them a lot more because they were, like Lamar was around, Gene Smith was around, and he knew Red. It took a while, but then we became very close. And uh, I had a lot of respect for him. He had a lot of respect for me and he knew I was doing my job. After a while, we became very close friends. Colonel Parker probably was one of the most degenerate gamblers I've ever known in my life. He played roulette and, and would put, put, put chips on every number. Uh, he would uh, play craps and bet the horn, the center. Uh, one night I was up about God, I think I was up fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Remember, he, I was just, I was running the crap table crazy, and he came up and took my money and put it on. Don't pass. You threw and a seven. I, and I threw a seven, and 
lost it all. <laughs> One pop. And I just, I wanted to throw up, but I couldn't. <laughs> and I said, you know, Jesus, God, I said, I'd work my butt off here. I said, I'm, he said, how much did you start off with? I said, I started off with 2000 So he counted out $2,000 and gave it to me. He said, now you're even. I went, God, <laughs> my. But I mean, he was right. I was even. Colonel, I, you know, I was Colonel even. gambled I, you know, in a way. I only lost $2,000. You know, we all have our little idiosyncrasies. That was his. His was gambling. And, and I loved him to death, but he didn't play the game like you have to play it to win. I mean, he would go through Just with those on roulette, and he would drop five or six chips there, two on that one, 10 or 12 on this one, and that's he'd, whatever fell out of his hand. Yeah. That's what he'd do. And when he hit, yeah. he didn't really win, because he had more bet than what it would But he thought off. he did. Yeah. I mean, listen, one night in between shows, and <clears throat> this was in 70, and we were at the crab table, and he called me and said, listen, he said, you got to stay with me here. And I said, well, I said, you know, I said, I've got to go upstairs early. He said, no, you stay here. He said, I'll get you up there on time. And I said, okay. So in a period of an hour and a half, he lost over a million and a quarter. I have, and I said, I turned around and looked at him. I said, you know, you got to be wealthy. I said, I, good God. He said, well, it all works out in the end. He almost became a shell for the hotel. You know, the way he, he drew people it. to the table. When we were playing Vegas and I was going through, I'd got Elvis downstairs for the early show and I had to go back up to the suite. So instead of going through the back corridors, I went out the front and went through the, the casino and, and then the showroom. And Colonel was at a roulette table there and my wife was pregnant. As I went by, I just said hi to him, Mr. Parkhill, George Parkhill, RCA exec, always with him. And uh, Colonel said, Sonny, give me a number. And I said, well, my child is due on the 24th of September, so 24. So he put down a couple of chips on 24. It hit, straight up. Colonel said, why didn't you tell me you were real sure about that number? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he only had two on there and he had other stacks of eight to 10, 12 on other numbers and George is just grinning. The great uh, precipitation of, bar of problems was over his gamble. And I was believed at the end, the reason he was playing the hotels was trying to pay off the Colonel's debts. So I don't know what truth there was to that. I don't know, but Colonel Yeah, we Elvis can't really Elvis, speak of his personal finance because yeah, we didn't Elvis have that. Elvis would consider it, it was a thorn in his side. And it really, really, you know, when they started that, when they were doing all that fighting, you know, they had me in the middle of it. Now there's several years from 1967 until mid 72 that I left on my own reconnaissance. And I stepped away from Elvis's world because there was a lot of resentment between the guys who worked for Elvis and especially Colonel Parker, who thought that I had an agenda that I was trying to take Elvis away from him and perhaps become his manager or lead him down a path that was contrary to what the Colonel had in mind for Elvis. I did want Elvis to wake up. And if I had an agenda, that was it for Elvis to wake up and to become his own man and to do the things that I know that Elvis really wanted to do. Now, at the end of Elvis's life, there's no question about it. He was on the verge and made plans to fire Colonel Parker, to cut down his entourage to four to five people. He wanted an entire new career, a new life, a new lifestyle. With his mental health on the decline, as well as his extremely busy work schedule, courtesy of the Colonel, Elvis's marriage was on the rocks. On February 24, 1972, Elvis and Priscilla separated. In 1972, Johnny Rivers and I became very, very close friends. And I began, I began working for him. One afternoon, I get a phone call from John. He said, Larry, Elvis needs you, man. I said, what do you mean? He said, he broke up with Priscilla. She left him. He's going through a lot. He called me up, and he told me he's going through a lot of things, and I just know that you've got to be in his life again. Let's go to Vegas. I said, OK, let's go. So Johnny and his girlfriend and a few other people and I, we went to Vegas. We sat in one of Elvis's booths. During the show, 
Elvis introduced Johnny to the audience. When the show was over, the maitre d' came up and said, Elvis would like you all to come backstage. I hadn't seen Elvis in a couple of years. We went backstage. Elvis came out of his dressing room, and he walked up to me, and we just hugged. On his 38th birthday, January 8th, 1973, Elvis filed for divorce. Well, <clears throat> it wasn't because Priscilla left for Mike Stone. I think it was that she had the affrontery to leave him. And I think that's where it all started from. It's like, you know, uh, Priscilla was married, Elvis wasn't. I think it's a good way to say it. And it, it really, you know, he didn't consider himself married, only she did. But so. were things changing for you? I mean, were you well, yeah, because the pressure was really starting to ramp up pretty bad, you know. And, uh, uh, he was losing, and he, he Elvis didn't like to lose. I don't, but I don't think it's Elvis more so than any other man, uh, especially when you find out she's going out with somebody else. It's a blow to any man's psyche. I don't think that, uh, and especially to his. I wish I'd have had a support system around me that he did when I was going to do my first, first divorce. As everything else in Elvis's life got worse, so too did his physical health. The Memphis Mafia regret not noticing the signs before, and those that did notice say they didn't expect it to get as bad as it was. I never thought it was a permanent thing. In 64, he had taken too much sleep medication, and when I got, when I was first getting to Graceland, Vernon was walking down the steps with Elvis with a breathing thing on. He was having a hard time breathing, and when he saw me, he kind of snapped out of it, and he took the breathing thing off because he didn't want me to see him in a compromising situation. He said, kind of winked at me and said, boy, this California air will get to you. <laughs> and, that, and, and it was never mentioned again. I'd only seen Elvis as this god, whether we were playing football or fast-witted, all this stuff. And here is walk, being helped down the stairs with a breathing thing. I must say, this is painful for me, that when Elvis came on stage, he gave such a gr I mean, the guy, whoever has not seen Elvis live has missed the greatest entertainer of the 20th century. But when I saw him, I, I, my heart sank because I knew that something was wrong. I can see it in his eyes, I saw it in his face. The body doesn't, doesn't hide anything, you just can't, and especially when you know someone. About 74, I started, I started seeing it. Uh, he wasn't taking care of himself. Things started happening to him that were not normal. And the doctors being around, I, I look at, I watch, I'm not, I'm not clairvoyant, and I, I, I'm not anything like that. I, I just look at things, and things are not normal, I pick up on it. I've seen him way overweight, almost between five movies. It didn't just happen in 1977 or 76. And that was the, 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 that was the part of the inner circle. You could gain 30 pounds and go to movies and nobody knew about it because it was, you know, wasn't gonna get to the press, it wasn't, you know, nobody was gonna take pictures, any, anything like that. All of us were not staying up late at night not taking a sleeping pill to go to sleep. It's not like we were these straight guys with this one freak over here. Uh, it wasn't that way. We were all in the boat together in various levels. I got into Los Angeles. I had to do some things in Los Angeles, and I called Elvis. He picked the phone. I said, you OK? Oh, Lamar, I'm OK. I said, what do you mean you're OK? He said, well, he said, you know, my eyes hurt me. And he said, you know, I don't feel good. I said, Elvis, let's just forget this tour. Blow this damn tour off. I said, just. You know, I said, let's get back. And I said, you know, a couple, three of us will get together. We'll move to Hawaii for a while and get, you, you know, just kind of tighten up and just, he said, Lamar, it's a good thought. When we get back, we'll do it. Well, you know, he didn't make it. Elvis had a lot of physical problems that were really eating away at him. He had glaucoma. He had hypertension. Do you know that every night after his show, his blood pressure would shoot up to 180, 200 every night. And that's a tremendous strain on the heart. Elvis had a spastic, twisted colon. 
I can't tell you the problems that, that, that plagued him because of it, how uncomfortable he was and how his body, especially the lower part of his body, started to blow up and balloon. He also had his blood sugar that was a little too high. His body would start to get bruises on his leg. One night we were on tour and when Elvis left the stage, he was totally blinded because of all the, the, the flash cubes going off, the glaucoma, his sensitive eyes. He tripped and fell down the stairs at the back of the stage, twisted his ankle. He had a very difficult time after that moving on stage. So the doctor was giving him medications every night to go to sleep. And I say medications, euphemistically, we're talking about poison. Elvis did not need these anymore. And he knew it. It's not like Elvis was in the dark. Elvis was abusing them. He's responsible, but he's also a victim. He was a victim because doctors were giving medications to him to help his conditions, all his various conditions. The combinations of these drugs were lethal. It only increased his health problems, no question about it. Elvis, in 1957, he would eat crisp bacon, sliced tomatoes, mashed potatoes and gravy, and sauerkraut, believe it or not, and mix it all together and eat it and loved it. And Elvis would eat stuff till he got tired of it and then he wouldn't eat anymore. So he got off of it. The last year of Elvis's life, he went back to eating mashed potatoes, sauerkraut. And I said, you know what you're doing here? What do you mean? I said, you're back, you're, it's what you used to eat in 57. He said, I never thought about that. So what we did is we really sort of majored everything we had and knew at the time to prevent it. And we did the best we could. And, but I mean, you couldn't, uh, you know, you couldn't outwit him. Uh, it's hard to outwit somebody like that. And, uh, and then he would fire you and you couldn't do any good. But if you hung in there, you could possibly keep him alive another day. So I would say that uh, that episode toward the end of his life was the most terrorizing thing we'd all gone through. It, all the fun that we had had 20 years before was gone and moments of great fun followed by continual panic. We didn't sleep. It was it was horrendous. It, it really, I, I don't think I've had anything before or since. I said, you lost your fucking mind. You remember that? Yeah. I said, I said, you have kept us awake. We have not slept. I said, you're beating us up so bad that we can't hold this thing together. I mean, you know what I mean? When I got to the point where I couldn't handle it any longer, I just unload. I said, Rick, I said, quit thinking about yourself. Think about us here for crying out loud. He said, well, I'm the one that's going through it. I said, really? Hmm. I said, ask how many, how, how long we slept. We'd be lucky if we get 30 minutes of sleep. You remember he'd call us and wake us up in the middle of the night? I mean, in the middle of the day, you'd have to get up and go check it out. I said, Elvis, why don't you just get, go to sleep, stop. And he just finally just beat us up so bad that we, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't recover. When I talk now, it's all retrospect because there's been 25 years of, of really examination and 25 years of, of thought process that goes in on a continual basis every day of my life. And it's the normal anatomical situations of a person getting older, but precipitating it with what he did to cause him to get older quicker was not good. And you don't want anybody that's your friend to go through that. And I think the horrendous part of it is, is that we could not stop it. I think to the day I die, that that'll be one of my burdens. And you know, we tried and we tried, but we couldn't. He, he was his own worst enemy. And so as a consequence, we still carry a lot of stuff with us. By the mid-70s, Elvis's drug habit had become a serious threat to his life. I tried not to let his moods a lot of times affect my moods. If I did, we were both in the pits of hell at that time, I'm, I'm, I'm literally. And so therefore, when I thought he was down, I was going to try to be up. And when he was up, I was automatically up. I mean, I was that in tune to him. But it was difficult. It was hard, you know. And 
you want to just say, God, man, you know, come on. It's not too late, you know. Get a grip in your life, you know, and, and get away from the drugs, you know. Don't, don't use them. You don't have to. And take a little time off. Nothing's that impressing. You don't owe anybody anything. If you get rid of me tomorrow, and I told him, man, I, and I meant it from the bottom of my heart, if you get rid of all these guys, they will understand. And if they don't, they were not your friends to start with. But take some time off. And he'd just look at me and say, I can't. I owe too much to too many people. I could not believe how he deteriorated in the year I was gone. When I saw the CBS special, I was shocked and I was pissed. And I called Colonel Parker one of the few times. I called him and I went and met with him. How could you let him be on camera like that? And he said, you're a manager. You have to give the artist uh, uh, offers. I said, how could you? He said, I put an offer out there that was ridiculous. And I took it to Elvis and he wanted to do it. The point is, is that he wasn't in great shape when I left. When I saw that, yeah, man looked like he was going to die. And of course he did. But he didn't look like that when I left. And when I saw him in Maryland, uh, he looked pretty good. Towards the end of Elvis's life, his health problems really accumulated. And his health is going downhill. I'll never forget the last time he played Vegas. A lot of phenomenal things happened. One night, I walked down to the casino. I just left Elvis. And I noticed there was a large group of people roped off. And they were all in front of a table watching someone gamble. And as I walked up, it was Colonel Parker by himself at the table with stacks of chips. And he was playing the sucker's game of all games. It was called the Wheel of Fortune. He's at the table, and he spots me in the crowd. Larry, he said, come on, come here, come here. Sit next to me. He said, I'm not doing too well. I need some luck. Give me some good thoughts, Larry. <laughs> I said, OK, Colonel, and I felt so uncomfortable. I really did. After about five, 10 minutes, I said, Colonel, maybe you'll do better now. I hope you will, but I have to get back upstairs because Elvis needs me. So I left. The Colonel was there for hours upon hours upon hours until like five o'clock in the morning, and he lost one and a half million dollars that night. When Elvis found out about it, he said, a million and a half dollars? That's obscene. Most people don't earn that kind of money working their whole life. And he goes and squanders money like that? He said, oh yeah, he can do it, because he's got me. I'm his ransom. What's gonna happen is he's gonna have to turn around, make a damn deal with me coming back to Vegas, which I, I don't like Vegas. This is Sin City, man. I don't like it here. I'm never gonna come back here again. <laughs> Ironically, he never did. Truth of the matter is, I do resent, I have resented Colonel Parker. God bless his soul, because he's passed on. Yeah, he was a genius, but I think he made some very, very bad choices in life. We were on tour in Louisville, Kentucky, and this was about four months before Elvis passed away. And Elvis, the night before, had a very difficult time. He felt he had a fever. He felt nauseous. He felt flu-like. He couldn't sleep. He had a very, very difficult night. It was late afternoon. Dr. Nick was Elvis' the doctor who traveled with us, was in the bedroom with Elvis. I was in the front room, and there was a pounding on the front, on the door, which was very unusual because we owned that floor. No one was allowed there. We had security cops positioned in front of the elevators. Everything was blocked off. So who would knock on the door like that? So I immediately walked over to the door, looked through the peephole, and there's Colonel Parker, who never came to visit Elvis on tour. I opened the door, and I said, Colonel. He said, where is he? I said, well, he's in the bedroom. Let, let me tell him you're here. He said, no, I'm going right in. So he, with his cane, he walked past me. He opened the door, and this is what I saw. Dr. Nick was holding Elvis's head. Elvis is in the bed, semi-conscious and he was moaning. He was, he was in such bad shape. And Dr. Nick was dunking Elvis' head into a bucket of ice water. 
to revive him. The door closed. And I thought immediately, OK, this is good. This is good. Now the old man, Parker, is going to see what's going on here. And he's going to see how bad the bad shape Elvis is in. And he's going to do something about it. I mean, he can't allow this to go on. It's inhuman. 90 seconds later, door opened up. Colonel Parker walks up to me. We stand toe to toe. And he stares coldly into my eyes. He says, now you listen to me. The only thing that's important is that that man is on stage tonight. He turned around and walked out. And my heart sank. He didn't care. He didn't care. What about Elvis? What about Elvis? Elvis is not a, a, to, a to, tomato can. He's not a commodity. He's a human being. Elvis should have gotten rid of him years and years ago. Elvis knew it. Elvis was a good guy. He was a loyal guy. Maybe he had a, a bit to do with his own masochism. But he should have gotten rid of Colonel Parker. And he knew it. And he was going to do it. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that if Elvis would have lived, he would have gotten rid of Colonel Parker. At this point in Elvis's life, by 1977, it was clear to him and everyone around him that there was no going back. I never knew he was dying until he died. Never knew that. I would go to my room certain nights and just cry. I felt helpless. I would pray to God. I thought that was the only thing I could really do outside of being Elvis's friend. One night, we're, I, I thought, I, I got to go tell someone. I got to talk to these guys. Some of them I knew not to talk to. Others I thought were open. And you know, all the people around Elvis, they all loved him. Even the ones that enabled him. There were some guys in the group that were terrific. They were excellent human beings. I remember one guy I went to after the, after the concert one night, I went into his room. And I said to, to, to him, I said, I'm really, really nervous. He said, what's wrong? I said, what's wrong? <laughs> Look at Elvis. Look what's going on. The man is sick. He's got such problems. I'm afraid something's going to happen. The guy said, hey, wait a minute. Wait, Larry. No, 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 no. You're the one who has the problem. Come on, you know about negativity. If you keep thinking this way, you're going to get sick. That's Elvis. What can happen to Elvis? In 20 years from now, he's going to look better than he does today. He's a singer. Singers rejuvenate themselves. They live to be really old. Dad, don't, don't make yourself sick. I left his room and I thought, I'm gonna, uh, this is madness. This is crazy. This is insane. They're, they're in total denial of what's going on. One or two people were quite aware. Did you discuss it with the other guys? Did you not oh, yeah. I told every one of them. They, they all know it, Sonny. All, I sit down and they used to get mad at me. I said, I'm telling you guys, ain't going to make it. The guy is ill. He's going to die. You know, I told Bill, I sat down with Billy one day, and I said, I'm going to tell you something. Billy, your cousin's getting ready to die. I said, he's sick. Oh, no. I said, I'm telling you, the man is not well. I never thought he was going to live. You know, I kept saying, I said, guys, this guy is not going to make it. You know, I used to tell Colonel, and I'd tell, you know, I'd tell Billy, remember, we used to sit down. I said, that guy ain't going to make it. I said, you remember? I said, there's no way a person can put himself through what he's putting himself through and make it. I'll tell you what. And remember, I told you, I said, in August, I said, he'll never see the see, snow fly. And felt. he didn't. I don't know how you felt, but, you know, when we left in 76 and wasn't around anymore, other than talking to some of the guys, I never thought he'd die. I saw him, uh, if you'll remember correctly, in late 74, whatever, up at College Park, Maryland. He got out of that limousine. I helped him out like I always do at the back of the hotel. His hair was unkempt. It was always done before it was unkempt. He didn't have a hat or mm. one of those hats or anything on it. And it, I thought, what in the world? He says, hey, Sonny, very slurred. And I thought, oh, boy. We got upstairs. I asked the guys what was going on. They told me. We went up to the security room, and we said a circle prayer for Elvis because I, I was so scared of what was happening. And from that point on, I started being scared. I started being worried about him because it just, it was just there. I went up to the bedroom one night, just him and I, and I was sitting over in that chair. And he kept looking at me. He said, you know, Lamar, there'll always be a star in your crown. Well, I didn't know what he meant by that. And I said, well, who's wearing a crown? I had, what are you talking about? And I just, you know, I just, it, he said, because, you know, you're nice to people and you, 
you, you take care of people? And I said, yeah, it's part of my nature. And uh, I said, you know, and he was starting to start. I said, you know what? I said, you're going to probably fire me for what I'm about to say. But I said, I'm going to say it because I got to get it off my chest. It's bothering me. And he said, now you've established what's going to happen. I said, you're going to die. I said, you cannot keep like you're going. You're going to die. I said, you are on the verge of dying. When I looked at him, when I looked at him, and he looked back at me and he said, let me tell you something. He said, I'll be there when they lower your big ass into the ground. Yeah. And I said, no, you won't. And he got mad and he said, if you bring this up again, he said, I'll drop kick your ass to Cleveland. I said, Elvis, I don't have to bring it up. People see it. That was my biggest fear around him. I just could not see Elvis Presley dying. You know, I, I could see I him did. stepping out on that stage and not being able to do his show and I'm the sorry. fans booing him. I could see that. They, and I the knew fans what wouldn't that let it. would do to The him. fans would not. That would have. You know what happened? That, you know what happened finished. to Elvis? Let me give you a classic example of fans literally can cause you a lot of problems and they don't mean to. They accepted him the way he was. In any manner. Had they got up and said, get fucked. We don't like the way you look. We're not coming to your shows. And I promise you, in 48 hours or 72 hours, he he'd have got himself so shaped up, it'd have been unbelievable. So in six months, he'd have been straight. So when Elvis came back about 1.30 in the morning, he walks into the door, and I walked in, and he looked at me. He took his glasses off, and he went like this. <sighs> he put his glasses back on. He walked upstairs. He never said a word. He didn't have to. I remember going back into the kitchen, into the den, and I sat down in the chair, and I just, I just, I just couldn't believe we're leaving the next day, August the 16th, to go on tour, and Elvis is ill. I feel that Elvis did feel there, possibly. I wasn't there, but I have a feeling that that last year I wasn't there, that he was feeling, was he ever going to be able to do it? Was he ever going to be able to stop it? And I don't know what his answer was. I'm going to ask him when I see him again. 9.30 AM, August 16th, 1977. Elvis couldn't sleep, so he told Ginger Alden, his new fiance, that he was going to read in the bathroom. 2 PM, Ginger woke up and realized Elvis wasn't next to her. So she went into the bathroom to check if he was okay. After initially thinking he had hit his head and knocked himself out, she quickly came to realize at just 42, the king of rock and roll was dead. Yeah, I was, at, uh, I was in Portland, Maine, and we had already set up, I'd been working all night long to set up security. And uh, it was a round hotel in Portland. No one will forget it. And on about 10, 15, I had gone to bed. And there was a big knock on my door about an hour and a half, about an hour after I'd gone to bed. And I woke up and, and it was Tom Hewlett knocking on my door. And he said, Colonel wants to see you. And I said, what about? I said, Tom, for Christ's sake, I'm worn out. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to bed. Come back in about a couple of hours. Let me get a couple of hours. He said, Lamar, you need to come right now. So I got up and slid my jeans on and I put my shirt on. And he said, Colonel, I see you right now. I said, what's going on, Tom? And Tom wouldn't say anything. So I followed Tom around the circle into Colonel's room. And uh, Colonel was on the phone to Joe. So he hung up the phone, and I was leaning on the television set. It was on a stand. And uh, he walked up within probably eight inches of my face, 10 inches. And he said, you got to go back to Memphis. You got to meet with Vernon. Elvis is dead. And I looked at him, and it hit me like, like a sledgehammer. and I. And I looked at him and I said, listen. I said, you know what? I said, you finally ran him to the ground, didn't you? And he got mad at me. I said, you know what I'm talking about. I said, y'all wouldn't let him up. You kept working, you kept working. He said, you need to leave. And I said, yeah, I'm gonna leave to keep from knocking your damn teeth out. The morning that Elvis died, I was doing an interview and he was already lying there dead. Of course, none of us knew it. I was out in California. And I was doing an interview with uh, uh, Bob Green, I think his name is, with the Chicago yeah, remember paper. Where? And we were talking about what kind of shape he was in and how he was going downhill. And he asked me, so it wouldn't surprise you at all then to pick up a paper someday and it's saying Elvis Presley had died. And I said, 
No, no, I said it wouldn't, but it also would, because it's almost like he's immortal, but when you come down to the truth of the situation, yeah, that could, that could really I, happen. Can I ask, he, did you get that feeling after you left Elvis or while you was with him, too? We had what, two or three years dying? That you, he might, yeah. But like I said, it was a double-edged sword. I didn't, I thought he was immortal. I mean, every time something happened, something happened like an angel, you know, his guardian angel pulled him out of it. So I had that feeling, but at the same time, Billy, what I saw in 76, it scared me to death. And he and died by thought, himself. Yeah. And that's what makes me fucking mad. Yeah. That makes me mad. Uh, he died he, by himself. See, that, I uh, never thought of him, you know, as, as dying. I did know what was going on and I didn't like it, you know. That's one of the reasons, I guess, I really went back to work. You were scared, weren't you, when oh, you saw him all yeah, bloated yeah, up yeah, and you sure. thought, what's not I working worried, right? I was worried about him, but I was worried about his health, not to the point of where he would die. I was worried about Elvis having a stroke or something like that. He could not have lived with that. He could not have lived not being accepted by his fans. He couldn't live with being not being accepted by us. Let me tell you something. Had he known he was going to Europe, he would have gone on the strictest regimen that anybody could. Yeah. And I promise you, when we got off that plane in London, he'd have scared people to death. He looks today. Sure, like he would. Satellite show. Remember how he got the shape? That's that? right. I mean, right. he had a charge to do something. The great thing that kept Elvis going was from one thing to the other. What happened to him is Colonel let him die of apathy. And I blame Tom Parker as more as I blame anybody in this world for putting him the way he did because Tom Parker was an illegal alien and would not go out of the country. And as a consequence, we stuck our ass over here forever. Had he toured the world outside the United States, he has still been fucking the morning. Morning. The the was Amen. Amen. The morning Amen. Died. That's why I get mad when I think about it. I get yeah. so fucking mad. That's why I, I say, that's why I say, if had he gone, had we set up a if world, had another I sat down with sure. Colonel one day, I said, you know what? I said, every damn thing that you're shooting your mouth off. He got really mad at me. In fact, he called Elvis to fire me once again. And I said, you got to get him out of the country. I said, we've worn this country out. You have got to get him around the world. I don't care about security. I don't care about anything. You got to get him out. And he said, we can't. I said, Colonel, you can do it. It needs to be done. And I said, this will make, I said, this will change this whole guy's career. I gotta career. tell you what the colonel told me. I gotta tell you this, Martin. This is in defense of the colonel, it's a fact. Oh, fuck the colonel. Colonel Parker was concerned about the drugs and the guns in the other countries. Uh, he, he said, concerned about they, he cannot get away with carrying those guns. He cannot get away with those pills. He was concerned about himself, too. He can't do it, and we can't go there unless he can stop and not take it. He would he's have. Got Dr. Nick with him. Well, he would have. He said, there's still a limit, and it, they'll jump on it. He would have stopped, for Christ's sake. That's great. What? Hey, back the camera off for 10 minutes. No, yeah, we just moved you off. <laughs> you weren't even on camera shooting. I don't give a shit. I get mad. You know me, I get sick, but I get fucking mad. Very good. Great. It came to life. Get out When Elvis died in 1977, the cause of death was ruled as a heart attack. But decades on, advances in medical science have found evidence which could point to a much more sinister reality. In the months leading up to his death, Elvis's body was completely ravaged. He was suffering from high blood pressure as a result of a lifelong high cholesterol diet. His lungs were under the strain of emphysema, a long-term disease which causes shortness of breath. His heart was twice the normal size. He had excessive liver damage, and his colon was shockingly enlarged. But it was his addiction to prescription drugs that finally pushed his body over the edge. We may never know the full story of what happened to Elvis, but the answers may come eventually. Vernon Presley, Elvis's father, had his son's autopsy report sealed away until 2027, the 50th anniversary of the singer's death. Perhaps that autopsy holds the key to unraveling the mystery, a mystery that saw the world lose one of its greatest icons in music history. You know, not a day goes by that something doesn't happen in my life through a phone call, seeing somebody, that someone doesn't 
sparked something in me, thoughts about Elvis. The dreams are not about him and death. The dreams, when I have a dream about him, it's always about something, possibly because someone triggered something in me that day when we talked about it, and that night I'll dream about that situation I talked about that day. And uh, it's, it's always a, a dream of where he's saying something to me. We, one time we were riding his snowmobiles at Grayson with no snow. He had them, the sl sl ski part, replaced with wheels, and we were racing over the grounds with these snowmobiles, and, and which we actually did. And I'll dream about it, and he uh, ran me off the road one time in, in the dream. He never did that in first, but he ran me off the road in time, and I hit a curb, and I took off, the ski machine took off, and uh, I woke up laughing. It's weird, he could be, and I saw this, but I don't dream about it, I don't think about it. But there were times I looked at him, he looked very lonely, and he'd be in the middle of a bunch of people. And I'd look at him, and I'd think, he did, he's not even where he wants to be right there. He's, he's not feeling anything right now. He's, times I'd go over to him, I'd say, hey, boss. Hey, sonny. About ready to go? Yeah, yeah, let's go. Get him out of that. He wasn't enjoying it. He wasn't enjoying it. Listening to me talk, you know I talk in superlative terms about Elvis. He was the most generous, the most beautiful, inside and out human being you ever want to meet. Whoever would meet him today would become his friend. First time I met him, what kind of guy he was, what he'd done for me over the years. I'm in a house that he put $12,000 down for me to get to buy. Uh, I'm driveway, there's cars that he bought me. And uh, it was rough. Boy, it was rough. God, his laugh was infectious. <laughs> There's been reports <clears throat> that people have said, yeah, you laugh when Elvis laughed, understand. <clears throat> In the sense he was saying it, or it's been said, it's not true. But in another sense, it is true. And the reason it is true is because he's so infectious. You leave these little laughing machines with the gigglers on these little things you print and they start laughing. <laughs> it's a weird, it makes you laugh. You're laughing because you're hearing a little machine laugh. And with him, it was so infectious when he laughed. You, anytime you hear him, Elvis, that's the way it is, or any film on him, audio, you hear that laughter. And it makes you sit there and chuckle right then. You start laughing with him. And uh, that's what was going through our mind. And then when Red came over, we talked about what all had gone wrong so fast. And uh, tell you what, I miss him today. I apologize, I get emotional. Don't apologize. Just rough. Okay, that's, that's fine. Come on, big man. Mm. Ah, I'm <laughs> <laughs>